Let's take a moment and bow and ask God to bless our time here together. Our Father and our God, we come to you today with the hopeful expectation and desire and request that you open our hearts to what you would have us to know and to be. Father God, conform us to the image of your Son. Work in us in such a way that we will be godly, more godly and holy today than we were yesterday. I ask also that you would give me the words to speak that would be true, that would be consistent with your word and be an encouragement to your people. These things I pray in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Let me ask you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 13. And I want to read a little section there. Remembering that what I'm attempting to do in this part of us going through Mark is taking a short little detour and talking about prayer. And the events of this past week, or two or three actually, have given us reason and pause to contemplate eternity. What we do here on Sunday morning is important. It is not our end all for spiritual growth and nurture, but it is, it is kind of like a, a jump start for the week as we walk through our life. We all have heard about the tragedy of, of Gabby. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Young girl from Florida. They went off and, you know, unfortunately her, I don't know if it was her fiance or husband, it's a tragedy with her life ending. And then this past week, just a few days ago, we had a policeman who lost his life very much unexpectedly. And another person also lost their life. And you know the story of what all has taken place and not everything has fleshed out just yet. I was thinking as, you know, every week God does this. The songs that we sing are a good segue into what I want to be talking about. And I want you to look with me. Because have you ever wondered when these things happen and, and people are watching on TV and people are being interviewed, what did you see, what happened, what took place? And all the, the you know, the police chiefs and all those guys, they're, they're making comments and there was a time when an event happened and let's just kind of say that CNN was there to put a microphone and say, Jesus, what do you think about this? In Luke chapter 13, I want us to look at verse 2. Now, let's, let's look at verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And here's how Jesus responds. Look at it. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here's the, the thoughts that have been going through my mind in preparation for actually today's message is that there are a number of people, let's say two people, just from the deal of straight to opening illustration, two people woke up, I think it was Thursday morning, might have been Friday morning, and they had no idea that by the end of the day they would be in eternity. They had no idea. They woke up, just like we do, had breakfast, 
maybe a cup, glass of cup, glass of coffee, cup of coffee, cinnamon roll. I don't know, but they had no way of knowing that their name would be called and they would transition from this life to the next. So what does Jesus say in response to that? Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That means that what we are talking about right here at this moment today is important. Some get it. Some get it. And, and when they, they leave here today, hopefully, God willing, by the power of the Spirit, they will be spurred on to some things we're going to be talking about here in a moment. Invariably, there are always some who will agree, and then the week plays out just like the week before with no changes. I hope that is not the case. I've mentioned before, and this is where I don't want you to think this is what I had planned to say anyway. Do you remember how we've talked about every day we're six feet from death? Do you remember that? When we're driving a street, I was driving up a curvy road to the way here, and all it would take would be for someone to foolishly be looking on their cell phone and there was a collision and hopefully the airbags deploy and do their thing but we just never know the way we live here and now day by day is going to prepare us for the what our eternity will be like you remember we've before looked at the passage of scripture in Corinthians where it talks about we are to build our foundation by the works that we do on gold, on silver, and precious stones. And that there are people who, who build their foundation on wood, hay, and stubble. And in the last day, in the last day, our works on this life, how we've lived, will be tested by fire. And that there are, now listen, every Christian is going to heaven. Every Christian is going to heaven. There is no possibility of it not happening. However, there will be different levels of rewards in heaven. This particular passage that I'm referencing talks about people who build their life's foundation on wood, hay, and stubble. When the fire tests it, they will make it into heaven, but it'll be smelling like smoke. I don't, want us, I don't want you, I want every one of us, when we enter the gates of glory, that it is a, a joyful expectation, that it's something that we have done and lived and how we've prepared our life now for when we get to glory and when that time comes, either expectedly or unexpectedly. So how do we do that? I'm going to say three things. Number one, prayer. Number two, scripture. And number three, worship. Which one is the easiest of those three? Worship. All I got to do is get in my car and plug in my iPod and hit a playlist and buddy, I'm, I'm going. I'm going. It's a little more difficult to set aside time to read the scripture. Am I right? I mean, it with our days that kind of get bunched up and it's a little bit harder to be disciplined to read scripture the most difficult thing i have found in my life is sustained prayer did you hear the way i i kind of put that forward sustained prayer now i, I honestly i pray a lot i try to be in an attitude of prayer but when it comes to really praying in a sustained manner my mind goes crazy because I start wondering about stuff at work. I start wondering about the kids. I start wondering about which of the fast food restaurants I'm going to go to to pick up supper. I mean, you know, it's easy to get distracted. But if I want to prepare for now, if I want to have a full life now that is free, that is free from anxiety, that is free from worry, that is free from fear, 
if it is, and it's free from not having to be dependent on what people who are doing in Montgomery or Washington, D.C., if I want to be content now, it has to do with those three things. Now, I want you to, to look with me at Philippians chapter 3. While, while we're turning to Philippians, I want to remind you now of the things that we said last week in a very quick um, recounting. We said last week that prayer is not powerful, but the God who answers prayer is. Second, we said that with the faith of a mustard seed in God, all things are possible. We also mentioned that praying in Jesus' name means being consistent with his will to glorify God the Father. And here's where I want us to begin thinking. Therefore, prayer hinges on the condition of our heart. I'm not necessarily talking about whether or not we're talking about, this is a Christian's message. This message is not one that I would suggest for unbelievers. This is for Christians. And so the condition of our heart may be saved, but it may have wandered and not be as passionate toward God as it should be. Because I'll tell you this, that when our heart is passionate towards someone else, we can't help but do what we do. In other words, my heart and my life is passionate toward my wife, Pam. Therefore, everything that I try to figure out what, what would help Pam? What could, would be good with Pam? I, you know, my life, my life is directed towards her because of my love for her. When we have love for God, our heart has a love for God. It is going to pull and direct us toward Him. So the condition of our heart with God is huge. We also mentioned last week, Psalm 37, 4, where we talked about delight, my, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of, my, of your heart. I, I, I continue thinking this week, do I delight myself in the Lord? Do I want to know him more intimately? Is it more important to me to interact and, and read scripture and pray to God and worship than it is to piddle with anything else. Because that's what's going to make the difference in who we are, how we live, and how we interact with this world. Now, Philippians 3.10, 3, 7, 3, 7, Philippians 3.7, is what Psalm 37.4 looks like. I want us to, to begin with that thought of Psalm 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of His heart. And what we said is that when the desire of your heart is God and you delight in Him, God gives Him more of Himself. You know what the best thing God gives us is? Himself. Himself. That is the absolute... I heard a guy say one time, when Jesus is all you have, that's when you realize Jesus is all you need. When we, when we relish and love God, everything else just falls aside. And now in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, this is what Psalm 37, 4 looks like. Now, now let's look at it. It's familiar. You've read it before. But let's just kind of settle down into it and really almost interact with, is this me? Is this me? Let's read it. Paul wrote, Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of, and we need to have this next line underlined or highlighted or something, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. There it is. There it is. Paul is saying, I am willing, I'm going to look at my life, and if, it, if, it, and if it's a job, and that job is keeping me from knowing Christ, then be gone. If it's, try this one on for size, if it's my own attitude, 
are the things that I want more important than knowing God and what he wants in my life. But Paul is saying here that the most important thing to him was to know Christ. And that nothing could compare to that. And Jesus really kind of pointed to that earlier when he said, if you do not hate your father and your mother and your brothers and sisters and children and even your own life, you're not worthy of being my disciple. Jesus wasn't saying to hate them. He's saying that your love for me is to be so much greater that if it came down to it, choosing them or me, it wouldn't be a hard decision. That's what he's saying here. And that's what Paul is writing. Let's continue reading. He says, for his sake. You see that? He's not really trying to say, I want to build up a whole bunch of, of, of rewards in heaven here. I'm not trying to, to move. I'm not trying to get on Golden Street or whatever it is in heaven. He said, in order, he says here that for the sake of Christ, to glorify him, to honor him, to put him first. I have suffered, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them in as rubbish. Stop for a minute. What have we lost? What have we given up? Us. In order to know Christ better. Meditate and think through that a little bit. What have we made a conscious choice to give up and not, and not look back because that was keeping us from being closer to Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, this, look, I hope this is beating y'all up because trust me, I got beat up a lot worse than y'all did this whole week when I was writing this. Okay? <laughs> Believe me, none of, none of what I'm saying is getting out of, from behind this pulpit until it's first been working its way through me and I'm still struggling with it. Let's go back to the scripture. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Look at this. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. In other words, it's not about religion. It's not religion doesn't get you close to God. I don't care what any other religion says. Keeping religion is not getting you close to God. That's why, uh, who, who was the guy that came to Jesus in, in, in John 3? Uh, uh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. He was the most religious. He was more religious than any of us will ever be. And Jesus looked at him and said, you've got to be born again, brother. It's not about your pedigree. It's not about keeping the law. You've got to be born again. And that's when it starts up. But let, let's keep going here. That I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, in other words, religion, but that which comes through faith. You see, that goes back to that mustard uh, seed of faith. He, he's talking about faith here again. The righteousness from who? God. Don't blow by that. If we are saved, if we are growing, no, we will grow. If we are saved, and who we are in Christ is from God. Do you see that? It's not because of who I am, what I do, how many degrees I have, how much I study or how much I memorize scripture. Where I am in relationship to God is a gift from God that I participate with him. I know that sounds confusing, but it's true. If God didn't start it in me, I wouldn't do it. But I've got to also do it or it ain't going to happen. Just trust me on that one. Look at verse 10. That I may know him. That, that's the whole key right there. That I may know him. And, and what, what's the result of that? It's the next one. And the power of his resurrection. When you know Christ... You have had a miracle take place in your life that is the exact same as Jesus Christ himself being raised from the dead so that we have also the power of his resurrection in us. And I really kind of wish Paul had stopped there. Can I get an amen? Did you look ahead? What is the next thing he's, he also, he says that I may know him. Got that one. Check it off. Love it. Come on. 
and the power of his resurrection. Check it off. Like that one. And they share in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. I can explain the becoming like him in his death better and easier than I can sharing his sufferings. Jesus says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Jesus told us that becoming like him was going to have some negative pushback in this world. You know what becoming like him in his death is? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I got to tell you, the, song, the two songs that we sang last, uh, one of them was I'll Fly Away. Y'all heard enough about that? When we all get to heaven, you have no idea how, how all-consuming that thought is in my mind and heart. I, I, have, I have said it so many times, my kids, my wife, my mom, everybody in my family is tired of hearing it, but I'm going to say it again. I can't wait to see Jesus. I cannot wait. I don't know about y'all, but this world is painful. It's hard. But one of these days, here's what I know is going to happen, is that when I am drawing my last breath, that there's going to be a smile in my heart because I'm going to see at least one angel. I'm hoping two. It probably takes three to get me there. But I'm going to see at least one angel. No, nope, at least two. And I think one of them is going to be my guardian angel. And they're going to take me straight to heaven. Not to see my granny, not to see my grandmother, not to see my dad or my brother or anybody else. But it's to see Jesus. And you know what is so cool to me when I get this from the book of Psalms? is where it says, where it is written, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In other words, God is, when, when I get to go see Jesus, the first thing that that angel is going to do is say, there he is. And I'm going to get to run to him and he's going to hug me. And he's going to say, Ron, I'm glad you're home. It's good to see you. And after he and I fellowship for about a millennia or two, that's when I look for everybody else. And then there's going to be joy. There's going to be contentment. There's going to be happiness. There's going to be peace forevermore in an ever-increasing fashion. Now listen to me for a minute. Just a minute. Please listen to me. Jesus is wanting us to start tasting heaven now. That's what he wants. He wants us to begin now in the, in the heart of our hearts to begin having what was going to be fulfilled in heaven, which is love, joy, peace, patience, all those things. Contentment, that's what comes with it when you know Christ. Do you remember what else Jesus said? He said, my joy I give to you. Not as the world gives, but as I give. That's why I say I, I, when, I, when I am in a bad mood, the first thing that comes to my mind is how, how weak is your faith? I should never be in a bad mood. How many, let me ask y'all, anybody here ever just in the middle of your day gone into a bad mood? Anybody, any of y'all here woken up and before anything happened, you were in a bad mood? Well, guess what? That's the hen, that's the hen spirit. That's the sin spirit in us, but that ought not be. And we have a battle, a weapon for battle to, to combat that. And this is where I like praying out loud because I want Satan to hear me. He can't read my mind. Satan, you were a defeated foe at the cross. And Christ has saved me. He wrote my name in his book before the foundation of the world. And guess what? You have no power over me. Yeah, if you want to, you can kill me. Hot dog. That just means I'm going to heaven. What is it, what is it Paul said? To live as Christ, to die as gain. That's what I'm working towards. That's what I want to be like. I, I know my family will cry a little bit, but I've, I hope I've told them enough. I'm in heaven, guys. I'm celebrating. And that's what I want us to have now. Okay? Let, let's, let's keep going here. Turn to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. 
because I want I want to talk with you a little bit about how to to move toward joy, peace, happiness, contentment now. And by the way, uh, I think that whenever as we get older and our bodies start breaking down and we do stupid stuff like doing a flip over a little kid on a football field and we suffer for the you know what I think that just I, I think all that does is make us want to get to heaven more. That's all it does. I can remember Miss Britton as she was uh, coming to the end stages of life. She would tell me that she's tired, I'm tired. And and one time she said, "I'm looking forward to seeing my Lord." And I know that lady's heart, and I know that's what God puts in His children so that we long to see Him. Now, what did I tell you? What chapter in First Peter? I did five. Okay, did I tell you what verse? Okay. Verse 6. Here's how it happens in prayer now. This is the way we start. And, and by the way, look back up here. Peter wrote this book to a group of people who were going through hardship, persecution, trial, and tribulation. This book is written to people who are having a tough time. So whenever you're having a tough time, go to 1 Peter, start in chapter 1, verse 1, and read through it. Eventually, you'll get to chapter 5, verse 6. And here's what he writes. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in due time he may exalt you. And I love this next one. We've talked about it before. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God, my back's hurting. I know. God, I'm, I'm struggling with situations at work. I know. Talk to me about it. God, my children are not following the Lord. I know. Talk with me about it. Whenever or whatever our struggles, hardships, difficulties are, it says cast them on Him. Think, you remember those people that you've seen that take the net? And it's and and they they rear back and throw it and it's a circle, and it all hits the. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, let go of it, cast it on him, and that's what we do in prayer. Now go back to Philippians. I want to show you one more. It's another very familiar passage. The reason I go to familiar passages is because I want them to stick in your head. I want you to know, as I'm telling you where that passage is, that you know what it is. I want it to be driven into your heart. Philippians chapter 4. When you get there, look at me real quick because I'm going to start reading in about a second. All right, y'all ought to be close enough. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Paul writes. Remember, he's in prison. Chained between two guards, 24-7, about to get his head chopped off. Do not be anxious about what? I know I ask this a lot. How, how much is anything? It's everything. So whatever anxiety you're struggling with or have, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Now how can you not be anxious? Keep reading. But in everything by prayer, by prayer and worship, that's what supplication is. With thanksgiving about all the gifts he's given you, let your requests be made known to God. And when you make those requests to God, Paul writes, he will give it to you. No, he didn't. That's not what Paul wrote. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This verse does not say that he'll give you what you want because Paul wrote about a thorn in the flesh when God said no. He said my grace is sufficient. What's more important, getting what we want or the peace of God? For me, peace of God. As we grow and mature in prayer, let me tell you what will happen. You will more and more cast your anxieties on Jesus. You'll do that. That means that our first thought in life is to flee to Christ and to pray to God. Second, the result will be God of peace guarding our hearts and our minds. 
And by the way, I want you to jot this one down. Don't turn there. But the result of all that I've been talking about this morning is John 14, 27. Write that one down. John 14, 27. And here's what Jesus said. See if you've heard this one. Peace I leave with you. This is Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then what does he say? Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Guys, do you see what we have in Christ? Why? Ron, why are you ever in a bad mood? Why do you ever get depressed? Why do you ever get angry? You've got to put your mind on glory and what Jesus has already done and what he has given you now. Now. And let me tell you, if you're here, you're a believer, every bit of this is also for you. You already have it. All you've got to do is just keep going to experiencing. Ask God for help. Ask Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit for help. He says he'll be there for you, and it'll happen. So what do I ask you to do? What I ask you to do is really not hard. How hard is it to eat a chocolate pie made by my wife? It ain't hard. How hard is it to eat a brisket? Baked by my mom. It ain't hard. It's not hard when it's something that nourishes your heart and soul and mind. And that's what I'm praying for all of us, that we will be closer with Christ. Let's pray. God help us. We are but dust. We want to be more like your son. But, Father, the struggle is hard. It's like Paul wrote in Romans 7, that the things he doesn't want to do, he does, and what he doesn't want to do, he does, and what he does, he doesn't want to do. He, he gets me confused. God, I feel that. But we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Help us, Father, every person here, to be closer with you this week by being in your word, through prayer and worship. In Jesus' name, amen.